Hello everybody and welcome back to You Can't Win. This is Tom here and I'm joined by Don as usual as well as returning guest Matt from Ghost Stories for the End of the World. Uh, we're going to be continuing on our exploration of strange times in Belgium. Last time we we did sort of a background slash contextualization of what was going on in Belgium and in Europe as far as uh, stay behinds and the breakup of the Third Reich and where some of those people that were kind of higher up in the food chain went and how they started to kind of plan their reorganization into various sort of like more shadowy, secretive sort of organizations. Today, we're going to zoom in on the life of one person in particular, uh, Mark Dutru. You say anything that like about Dutru, the Dutru affair to a Belgian, and uh, I'm sure they'll have a lot to tell you about it. It's, it's a very like notorious and like scandalous thing on the level of Jeffrey Epstein and all that um, that we have going on in the U.S. Uh, but this is like a not very well known to most people in the in North America. I'm not sure how widespread the uh, is in Europe. Could, what, what would you say, Matt? Is, do people kind of know about this outside of Belgium? Um, it was briefly relatively big uh, in Britain uh, towards the, like the end of the 90s, and I think more than anything that was a sheer sense of like relief that finally another country was having a, a huge pedophile scandal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's mostly, I mean, if you asked like, if I went outside now and asked somebody in the street, the, the chances are they would not know who it was. Yeah, sure. Just us weirdos who research this stuff, I guess. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, just for the listeners, I'll give you the short story and, uh, I'm not really like prone to doing this, but I do think that this kind of warrants like a bit of a trigger warning um, while reading about this stuff. You know, I've read about this like in like in kind of surface level just to get the, the basic idea of it before. Um, but digging deep into this stuff, it's the most like gut wrenching, horrific stuff I've ever read. Like I had to genuinely mm -hmm. like take breaks. Uh, it was like genuinely upsetting at times. Um I'm going to try to stay away from all the gory details on this. This is that's not really the point of what we're trying to do here today. So uh but it it's still it's just like the subject matter is uh it's just kind of inherently pretty disgusting and horrible. So um you know, I hope you're I hope you're ready for that. If that doesn't sound like your cup of tea right now, you know, maybe come back to this episode later cuz it's not necessarily the most pleasant stuff. Uh so anyway, the uh the short story is that there was this man, uh, Mark Dutru, who was arrested and pointed out to the police uh, a number of kidnappings that he had done on uh, young girls. And it turned out that he was doing this for a group of elite people in Belgian society, people who, you know, along the lines of the people we were talking about in the last episode or session, these um, aristocrats, politicians, uh People, not, not just Belgians as well, there were Frenchmen and, and whatnot involved as well. So basically, this guy got caught picking up girls for abuse and um, and trafficking. And it turned out that he was like tied up with, with uh, high society in Belgium. And they there was like a massive attempt at covering everything up, uh, which eventually led to a general strike uh, that shut down the government, shut down the country for a while. And there was a bunch of resignations and, and whatnot that came up from it. Um, so he's currently in prison. He's still alive. Uh, due to COVID, they actually like postponed some sort of interview they were going to do. I, you know, I'm not super. I think, uh, I think uh, it was uh, his parole hearing. Um, his parole hearing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So potentially sometime soon he may, he may be back on the streets. We'll have to see hmm. how that plays out. But um, yeah, let's dig into it. So the last time we left off, we kind of walked you through uh, 20th century history with a focus on Belgium and uh, and kind of what, what the right wing was doing, right? And we left right at 1960, and uh, we did that for a good reason, because that is the, the, uh, the Congo crisis. That's when the, uh, the Belgians pull out of their colonial holdings in the Congo, 
And uh, that's, you know, that's kind of where we're going to pick up with the Dutroux family because uh, Mark Dutroux was born in 1956, the oldest of five siblings. Uh, not sure if he was born in the Congo, but that's where his family was living. His parents were both teachers and they left in 1960. So uh, I just thought that was kind of an interesting little thing that like, you know, we kind of tied the colonial horrors that the Belgians perpetrated on people to a lot of the whatever you want to call it the nazi sympathies or whatever the kind of ultra right-wing mentality you know we kind of tied that to some of the stuff that was going on in in the congo and then you know we have this this uh guy mark dutroux who's connected to that in a kind of personal and maybe coincidental kind of way um but he you know he uh the son of teachers not coming from any kind of like uh aristocratic stock or anything just kind of a very common sort of background uh, but an unhappy one. Uh, he was beat by his parents frequently. Uh, they divorced in 71 when he was 16, and he left the house at that age as well. He, you know, he didn't really have anywhere to go, so he's kind of just a drifter, kind of getting involved into petty crimes, uh, including car theft, muggings, drug dealing, that sort of thing. Uh, and also, like, I wasn't able to verify this claim but it was kind of interesting he briefly worked as a male prostitute as a child prostitute actually and supposedly he came into contact with paul latinus i think that's how you pronounce his name uh who will come up later he's connected to some of you know if you listen to the last episode he's connected to like the westland new post and some of these other like uh nazi-ish right-wing uh stay behind groups Hmm. Um, so he marries at the age of 19, uh, in 1976, he has two children, but then divorces in 1983. And, uh, you know, during that first marriage, he later admitted that he was beating his wife and cheating on her with multiple people, including a woman named Michelle Martin or Martin, who would become his, uh, future wife. Uh, they would marry later in prison. And she was also his accomplice. In fact, she was kind of the wheel man for his kidnappings. So in 1986 in February is when uh, we have the first provable kidnapping. So we don't know how much he was getting involved in that sort of thing prior to this. But this is the first thing that we have like solid evidence on. And really throughout this, I'm really trying to stick to what can be substantiated with solid evidence and uh, stay away from speculation because I really want to just lay out the the verifiable facts of this case uh, so that we can address those and try to figure out what is the significance of this if this is, in fact, true. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, so according to his first wife, uh, Francois D., I have a quote from her here. Um, this is translated, by the way, so I, this may not be perfect. But uh, she said, I, rem I remember that before the first series of kidnappings in 1985, Mark Dutroux reproached me that I was responsible for him not being able to woo as many women as he wanted. He believed that other women were less interested in him because he was living with me. I remember that during that time we even slept apart for a while. It was during that time that Mark Dutroux told me that he was planning to kidnap girls. He told me that kidnapping and raping took less time than hitting on them. He said that would also be to my advantage. That way he had more time to spend on me. And after all, since he was doing it all for me, I had to help him with the kidnappings. There's a there are a lot of weird anecdotes like this. Uh, there are a few from his brother as well that are sort of. There's a story that his he approached his brother during the height of uh, his crime spree with a, his brother described it as a car full of dead bodies. Um, and there really? are loads of yeah, there are loads of strange stories like this of him saying and doing weird things. And it's odd that nobody thought to go to the police. It all seems to have come out after the fact. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, we'll see later that uh, he seemed to operate with a kind of a sense of like uh, protection from the authorities, you know, so maybe they understood that arrangement and they felt like they wouldn't be endangering themselves or something I, that but that's getting into speculation. So I'm going to back off of that a little bit. But um, yeah, it is it is odd. Like the, I have I have some quotes uh, coming up here that are, are similar kind of in that vein. Um, so. Okay, so this first kidnapping, uh, it's February 1986, 
and the victim is an 18 year old medical student named Axel D. Um, and I have some quotes from her describing the experience. So she said, when I got off the bus at the bus stop, I still had to walk some distance. I immediately felt that I was being followed by a dirty white van. The van passed me. A little further on, at the level of an electricity cabin, a man got out. He went and stood behind the van. When I wanted to walk past, both rear doors opened. One man pulled me inside while the other pushed me in the back. Once I was inside, they tried to put me at ease. They said they would ask for a ransom of 400,000 francs from my parents. They wanted that money because their friend had a rare vascular disease and needed surgery in the United States, they said. Uh, so obviously, like, there's no, I was not able to come across anything about some kind of need for surgery or anything. That So that seems completely made up. So the victim's eyes were taped, uh, taken to Dutro's new house. Uh, this was a new home that he had lived in for a few months. Um, so something I neglected to mention earlier, during his sort of early criminal history, he, he actually became quite successful, and I think he was plugged into some gangs or something, because he was able to acquire several properties, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of like six or seven properties is ultimately how many he was able to obtain. Wow. And yeah, quite a lot for someone who just left home at age 16 with, you know, not, I assume nothing in his pocket and just sort of built this all up through uh, petty crime, you know. So it, it sort of seems like very early on he got plugged into something uh, where he was able to, you know, just acquire these properties. Sure. Um, and I just, I found it notable, perhaps, that this particular house where he takes this victim is a new house. So it could be that this was perhaps the first victim, perhaps not. We don't really know that. Uh, but the fact that it was like a new property for him is perhaps notable. Um, so she's taken there with her eyes taped and she's locked in a cage for 24 hours. Um, she's then raped on the bed in that, um, in the house, uh, f over that period of time, several times by two men, presumably Dutru and, um, uh, a partner. And she's fed apple juice and chocolate during that period of time. Uh, so the men talk to her, uh, in between the, the, you know, bouts of rape. Uh, one tells her he had taken law courses and he explained to her how the pretrial detention system worked in Belgium. And the other says that they are part of a gang led by two men. And I had some translation issues here. So he either said an Italian and a crazy mute or an Italian and a crazy stupid person of, you know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. This is um, also something that you see in the uh, the ex-witness dossiers, they'll tell similar stories, you know, where in in between, like, bouts of abuse, the, the perps will sort of come into the room and sort of monologue at them for ages, just, you know, and it's, it all seems, I don't know, almost, you know, like, almost taunting or something. Um, yeah. It's it, crazy making stuff, is that It's weird, right? Like, maybe they're processing yeah. some kind of guilt or something, you know? Like, who knows? It's It's bizarre. Yeah. So eventually they uh, they drop her back off near her parents' home. They take 3,000 francs from her and her backpack, uh, which will be a mistake. Because a month and a half later, an accomplice, Jean Van Pettigam, who was age 20 at the time, presumably the second man with uh, Dutru, confesses to being one of Axel's three kidnappers after her backpack is found at his home. So the three kidnappers being Dutru, uh, Jean himself and Michelle Martin, who drove the van. He uh, further reveals Dutroux's complicity in a series of rapes, the youngest uh, victim being aged 11. And he, he kind of tells the story of how he met Dutroux. So he says that they met in March 1985, right at the same time when this stuff started to happen. Pettigame had just been discharged from the military and was preparing to marry his childhood sweetheart and the mother of his child, Patricia P. Um, and it turns out that Patricia knew the Dutru family very well. They lived in the same Wallonian town of Gutru. And I looked it up. Today, the population of that town is 3,300. Uh, so a very mm -hmm. small town. And uh, regularly babysat for Dutru's eldest son, Frederic. After one week living together, the Pedagam leaves his new wife to live in Dutru's caravan. So it, he's living in the van which is parked outside of Dutroux's family home, and then he would leave the van 
to go join them for dinner. So he's just doing this. Yeah, I don't know. Very weird, right? I, I don't mm-hmm. know what's going on with these people, right? Sure. Pettigam became Dutroux's penniless, not very intelligent, ideal assistant in crime. Uh, that's a quote. Uh, initially with petty theft, but moving quickly on to rapes uh, starting in May 1985. So John tells uh, detectives in 1986 after he's arrested the ease and self-confidence with which Dutroux decided to kidnap a girl that day. Uh, It was as if he went to buy a pack of cigarettes at the corner of the street. At one point, Dutroux said that he planned to have fun. Uh, Martin protested for a moment because Dutroux wanted to use her car. Only when we were in the car did Dutroux say he wanted to kidnap a girl. We drove past her in the car, and I pulled her in by the waist. We put tape over her eyes and mouth. The victim was raped and threatened with death by Dutroux in a garage box in Rue, which is another town. Uh, Dutroux took a picture of her and said it was destined for an American magazine. Both also tried to speak French with an American accent to fool their victim. And then um, the victim, Sylvie D., actually told investigators that one of the two men did not agree to the rape, which is uh, Jean. Um, so Jean says, yeah, that was me. Uh, she was too young. I got out of the car, but I did feel I had to kidnap her because I owed something to do true. And what that is, we never find out. I'm not really sure what this relationship is about between Jean and, and Mark. Uh, but that, that's interesting. So, uh, Michelle, uh, Martin also did not take part in the kidnapping herself. Uh, but do did proudly show her the photo that he had taken of the girl to her uh, afterwards uh yeah apparently uh, this was the same camera it was a polaroid camera that was used later to take uh pictures of other girls like as as uh, much as 10 years later so he was using the same camera through this whole whole time so in each kidnapping case uh, we kind of see the same methodology here uh using the van taping the eyes so that you know presumably so the victim can't see where they're going and then almost always photographing or videotaping the the uh, rapes. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Also, often these victims were targeted first by reconnaissance rides, meaning in the morning, Detro, and this I believe this is coming from Van Pettigam's uh, confessions, he would testify to this, that uh, in the morning, Dutro would kind of scope out and uh, figure out like what it, you know if it's a if it's a young girl how does she walk to school where, where's a good spot where people might not see them where they can kind of pull off the kidnapping and that sort of thing so it's it's premeditated on the level of that specific girl it wasn't some random like let's just cruise around until we find somebody kind of a thing it was mm-hmm. you know targeted there was also cases that Dutroux bragged about to Jean but that uh, he did not personally witness so. So later that year, in December, another victim, Elizabeth G., age 15, um, she was specifically told that her rape was an act of revenge against her father, who was, quote, not pure of heart. Um, And that same evening, the captors brought her back. They dropped her off 300 meters from her home, and one of the kidnappers gave her another 500 francs to go to the doctor to get a quote, bill for school, like a doctor's note or something, presumably. Mm -hmm. Uh, The girl was told that her rape was an act of revenge. So, yeah, so they are arrested uh, February 1986, so a few months later. Both Dutroux and and Michelle Martin, his mistress, they were arrested for the abduction and rape of five girls after Van Pettigam's confessions. And then he was convicted three years later in April 1989. So Dutroux gets 13 and a half years, Van Pettigam gets six and a half, and Martin gets five. Uh, the reason that Dutroux gets so many more years is because of some robberies, and there was actually like a, a, a murder of a 40-year-old woman that was involved with one of these robberies, and, and also included some kind of uh, really bizarre torture that I don't want to uh, describe exactly, but involved like razor blades and stuff. I, I didn't look too much into that, um, just because it was a little bit irrelevant um mm. specifically to this uh but that, that's the reason he got so many more years it wasn't like uh you know he wasn't convicted as like the leader of something or anything like that sure um so detrue marries martin in prison uh, that same year and they will eventually have three children but divorce in 2003 van, Pe- uh, van pettigam actually dies 
two years later, in August 1991, he's killed in Liege, where supposedly he ignores a stoplight on his moped uh, without a helmet and crashes into a bus. But this is something that people would kind of find very suspicious later on. They would kind of indicate that people keep dying, uh, you know, people that would either had the ability to testify to things or had testified or confessed to things, uh, they would end up dying. There was something like 25 mysterious deaths and suicides surrounding this case that would uh, occur in the in the kind of following years. So this is the first one. Although it could be simply that he, you know, did get, just had a traffic accident. We're not really sure. sure. Yeah. Something similar happened in, um, you know, the Rotherham case. I think there was a cop who was going to, he was on his way to give a statement um, to uh, the in, internal affairs, or I can't actually think what we call it over here. Um, and he died in a car accident, um, or he got hit by a car when he was going to the police station. And it's it's the same thing, you know, where it could be either or, but obviously you can't blame people for uh, being a little bit suspicious, you know, yeah. when that sort of thing happens. Yeah, for sure. So Michelle, uh, I got a quote from her here. I remember Mark being happy when he got out of prison and learned that Van Pettigam was dead. If he had known that Van Pettigam would snitch on him, he would have killed him right after the kidnappings, he said. So we we have like a, it's not true himself admitting it, but it's his wife saying that he would have killed Van Pettigam had he not died anyways. So yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it says that he got out of prison. He was, he, he got out of prison uh, three years later, April 1992, uh, both him and Martin were released for good behavior on parole. Uh, and this was a- against uh, a lot of recommendations. People were not really happy with this decision uh, that was made by the Minister of Justice, uh, Melchior Watelet. And uh, apologies for the pronunciation on this. I'm really bad with these, but <laughs> you get the point. Um I think like in Belgium, there is actually a policy where people's sentences are sort of reviewed after the, they've served like a third of it, mm-hmm. depending on what they did, mm-hmm. you know, and if they have exhibited like good behavior or they've reformed or something, they'll get released. So there is that at play here. But also I think the true's own mother had written a couple of letters to um, the magistrates and said like, when he goes to visit his grandmother on day release, like he is scaring the shit out of her with the things he's saying yes, um, yeah. about, you know, what he's going to do when he get out, gets out of prison. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a it is a bit strange that they never took any of that into account. Yeah, there's a, a lot of things. So, you know, he did make a good impression on social services and the prison chaplain. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember reading about he would he would like clean up the entire house of his needy grandmother uh during a day on penitentiary Mm. leave and he did that with the help of a a uh like a a sex worker who was in prison with him and and she said that dutro had said that he he was just doing this to for for the show you know he was trying to like Mm. make a good impression which to be honest it's hard to kind of like blame someone for trying to like (laughs) get out of good behavior doing that kind of thing you know okay i get that uh, but there were the house is still tidy either way. Yeah, so. yeah, good on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but yeah, besides his mother's notes, uh, which were like a constant thing that were always re- ignored, uh, th- this kind of mm. kept coming up and up. Um, but the public prosecutor's office advised against it. A psychiatrist had warned that Dutru remained dangerous. Um, prison governor Von Stewart. Uh, told would later tell a parliamentary commission that a medical report described him as a perverse psychopath, an explosive mix. He was an evident danger to society. Um, and I think something like that, it's not like they're saying he might steal a bicycle again sure. if we let him out of prison too early. You know, they're like, they're saying like this guy is a demon um, and th- there is no real justification for letting him out. Yeah, right. So that's kind of like the first period of his crime spree. Then there's a bit of a, like a four year period between 92 and 96 that there's not so constant uh, kidnappings Uh, that, that will start up again, starting in like 95, 96. Um, But during that period, that kind of quieter period, he's technically unemployed. I I believe it was as an, uh, an electrician, but he's not working as an electrician. Although he continues to live this lavish lifestyle, uh, lavish lifestyle, 
uh, with his six houses, uh, most of which lay vacant. He he lives in like one primary house, and then the other ones are generally just empty. Uh, he lives uh, he lived primarily in the district of Marcinelle near Charleroi, which is the largest city in the Wallonian province of Belgium. Um, during this period of time, it was later revealed uh, by investigations that transfers of foreign currency to his bank from Morocco and Saudi Arabia were occurring. Um, other outlets reported involvement in insurance fraud, drug dealing, car theft, and pimping. Um, he was able to convince a psychiatrist that he was disabled, which resulted in a government pension. And he also re- received large amounts of sleeping pills and sedatives from a doctor, uh, which he would later use to quiet the girls that he abducted. Also during this period, he begins construction of a dungeon mm. in his home. Mm. Um, mm. And I found pictures of this dungeon, and it's kind of shoddy work, to be honest. <laughs> okay. uh, it it yeah. looks really like... Uh, Grover House style, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, like very amateurish, but it, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like if someone uh, built like a kind of like a dog kennel looking thing in a basement is kind of what it looked like. Um, so it was hidden behind a massive concrete door, which was disguised as a shelf. Uh, it was seven feet long, uh, three feet mm-hmm. wide and about five and a half feet high. So not huge you know Mm -hmm. um and he was actually sued for having illegally widened an opening to his basement in an effort to put in a venting tube in uh june 1995 kind of funny that is so fucking dark like (laughs) yeah yeah you know in in the context of what happened jesus yeah uh yeah probably his greatest crime is that you know, illegally widening the opening in his basement. <laughs> yeah. Um, so authorities during this period routinely ignored tips. Uh, as you mentioned, Matt, the report from his mother, uh, apparently she had written numerous letters about her son holding girls prisoner. I guess he was just open about this with her. And and there were also claims that Jutru was offering people 3000 to $5,000 to kidnap girls. So he was... Walking around, offering people money for girls. He was building a dungeon in his place that he was even sued mm-hmm. for. He was receiving money from foreign countries. Uh, he was getting involved in insurance fraud and drug dealing and car theft and all kinds of stuff. Living in six different houses, or own, sorry, owning six different houses while being technically unemployed. Okay. So, 1995 the kidnapping spree kicks off again. So in June of 95, two girls, uh, w- both aged eight, are kidnapped. Uh, this is Julie Lejuen and Melissa Russo. Uh, so they are held in this dungeon that he's built. They're also abused there and videotaped. We'll, we'll have the evidence for that later. Kind of an interesting little side point that I just wanted to point out. I don't really have much to go on with this, but it is like substantiated uh and this would kind of draw media attention later that the last thing these girls did before they were kidnapped was go to a magic show a show of uh rosti rostelli who was a prominent magician and a hypnotist he was also like a you know was a magician and a hypnotist so apparently they were hypnotized at that show and then kidnapped afterwards just a couple months later in august uh two more girls uh these ones are aged 17 and 19 are kidnapped by Dutro and a new partner, uh, Michelle Le Livre. It's a male, uh, male Michelle. Um, and he was being paid in drugs, uh, apparently ecstasy pills. So um, because his dungeon was already occupied by the previous two girls that he had kidnapped, they were ch- simply chained up in another room. And they were presumably killed a few weeks later but by Dutro, but the details of that are unknown. Um, so at this point, there's a, a an investigation that's launched. It's called Operation Othello. That that would begin in June, and it, it was a uh, governed by the BOB, which is essentially the Belgian version of like an FBI organization. Um, Officer Rene Michaud was assigned to it uh, to a surveil Dutru. So on the first day of the uh, of the magistrate being assigned the case. He leaves for vacation, and he doesn't return until August. So 
he's assigned it in June 24th and he's a, he doesn't return until August 9th. It's kind of interesting how those line up with the kidnappings. The first mm-hmm. set of kidnappings are in June and then the second set are in August. I think that's just a coincidence, but it is a little bit interesting. Um, while she was on vacation, she did not appoint any substitute in her place. She would also never pursue any sort of, you know, she, she was the kind of the person who would ask for certain things and she never did anything. So like requesting phone taps, search warrants, uh, financial investigations. She never pursued any of these avenues uh, in her mm-hmm. investigations. So August 22, two more girls are, are kidnapped. And August 25, one of them escapes through the bathroom window and is standing out in the open shouting for help before she's pulled back into the house by Dutroux. Uh, a few weeks later, Dutroux would remove these girls from the house and murder them. All of this was not noticed by the surveillance team. You know, supposedly right. there's there's B.O.B. watching these this happen uh, and, and just it do, it's not reported at all. I think as well, um, they were usually I, I read a little bit about what the, the standard procedure should be in a case like this mm-hmm. in Belgium. And usually they should be assigned in uh, shifts that run, you know, 24 hours a day. So, you know, you, you do like an eight-hour shift or a 12-hour shift and then rotate and another team takes over. But these guys were clocking off. Uh, they were starting at, I think, nine every morning and clocking off at 8 p.m. every night. Right. Um, so that, you know, that gave him like plenty of time, really, like either either end of that. Um, yeah, just thought that. Though. Yeah, and you might think like, well, okay, maybe they just aren't able to see this somehow. If there's no, no nobody sees this, maybe it's sort of excusable. But the fact is, his neighbors were reporting things. So his neighbors mm-hmm. were reporting on the fact that his windows were being blacked out. Uh, he was always making noise in the basement, and that they had seen two girls of sixteen or eighteen years old that, that had just been seen in his garden. So those were being reported to the Bob by his neighbors and being ignored i think there was a a a couple of uh snitches as well like long time uh informants who had also been at this point they were passing along information that he'd approached them you know with the offer of uh sourcing girls for five thousand euros a pop Mm -hmm. um and again that was just not followed up on yeah yeah so they're really not trying here is basically the mm-hmm. what this sort of indicates to me. They're, they're not really attempting to surveil anything. If they notice something, they just turn the other way. They're not pursuing any kind of additional avenues to, to do anything about this. Eventually, though, Dutroux is arrested in December 1995 uh, for involvement in stealing a truck. Uh, so... Apparently what happened, it was a little bit unclear because I was reading all of this in translation. Most of this stuff, to be honest, is uh, it's either coming from a secondary source where I followed through on their uh, primary sources, which were not in English. So I had to kind of translate this to get to the, the primary sources. So I wasn't really able to get the full story of this. But apparently he stole a truck. Then three teenagers stole that truck from him. So he kidnapped those three teenagers and tortured them. And then one of them escaped and reported on him. So yeah. that's how he gets arrested. Not for mm-hmm. any of this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so as a result of that arrest, his house is then searched. In fact, it's searched twice, December 13 and December 19. But nothing comes of the search. So remember, he's got two girls you know, locked in the basement dungeon. And he's got two girls just chained up out in the open. And... During the searches, these they don't see this. Um, mm. In fact, this is kind of like a, a famous thing that a lot of people maybe will know about if they've heard of this case. Children were heard crying in the basement by a locksmith who had let the police into it. This locksmith was not aware of the details of the case. He didn't know that there was even like what this was about. He was just hired to to uh, uh, allow the police entry into the into the home, and he's the one who heard the crying in the basement and points it out to Michaud. Uh, you mm. know, who's the officer in charge of the investigation. And Mouchot dismisses it as saying, oh, it's probably coming from outside. They also did not investigate this modified section of the basement. Remember, the dungeon is like behind this f- false wall. And as I said, like in the pictures, you can, it's very shoddy. Like it's not like well hidden or like it's, it's pretty obvious like that somebody messed around with this, you know. 
during the um, investigation, uh, the point where um, Judge Conero took it over, um, I think him and an assistant, they went back to the house and they wanted to test Michelle's claims right. that sound carried oddly in the basement. So it was plausible that the kids sounded like they were outside. Yeah. In, in fact, it was the, one the of them, parents of the children. That's it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And they like they one of them stood inside the cell. They closed the door and they held like a full conversation with each other, perfectly legible right. uh, through. So basically, there's no way that Michaud seriously thought that it was coming from outside. Yeah. So that's that's pretty bleak. Um, although mm -hmm. Michaud did find some items um, that seemed pretty relevant. He found vaginal cream, chloroform, a speculum and chains. Um, they also found, uh, videotapes, which showed, uh, you know, they, they claimed they didn't watch the videotapes, but later, uh, when people did actually look at the tapes, uh, they found that they showed Dutro working on his basement and also, uh, a number of rapes were recorded on the tapes as well. Um, mm. I'm not sure how relevant this next bit of information is, but I thought I would share it in case it sort of rings a bell for anybody. So it says uh, on one of the tapes, the text Purdue de Vieux Mark was written, a reference to the TV program Lost from Sight, which dealt with missing children and on which Julie and Melissa had also featured. Michaud and team never watched the tapes and gave them back to Detroit's wife, Michelle Martin. Yeah, so they didn't watch the tapes and they returned it back to his wife. I forgot to mention that. Mm. And interestingly... After this search, this police officer, Christian Dubois, who was on the trail of related cases uh, surrounding a pedophile network centered around the ASCO company, which uh, Matt talked about in the previous session, uh, he approached Michaud, you know, because he felt like that there was, that their cases were linked, you know. Uh, Dubois had an informant who had stated that members of the network drive around in white Mercedes, uh, putting together catalogs of pictures of children for clients to choose from and then the clients would choose the children from the binders or whatever and uh, those children were then being kidnapped and locked up in belgium for a while before ex being exported to eastern europe or thailand and that the price of each ch uh, child was 7500 euros yeah dubois says that i remember that michaud told me that dutru went to countries in eastern europe the sums he mentioned for the kidnappings were similar to those given to me by my informant. Even today, this still keeps me awake at night. I feel responsible. Afterwards, in 1996, I looked into Dutro. Uh, you just felt it, that this was the man we were looking for. Um, so mm. the man in charge, uh, Michaud, uh, took no action at all after, these, after the searches and also did not follow up on anything with Dubois. This company, ASCO, it was, uh, th there's several people, uh, in this company or related to this company that will come up later, uh, namely Michelle Neu, uh, Bernard Weinstein, Michelle Le Lievre, uh, previously mentioned associate, um, and Michelle Martin, but not Dutro, uh, had all been spotted in the immediate surroundings of the company. Um, people in the neighborhood had also noted that Nuhu uh, was often surrounded by, quote, young Negro girls and had the impression that these girls were on transit. Five mattresses and some baby milk were found inside the company's headquarters after it had gone bankrupt in 1994. Um, yeah. That's horrifying. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty grim stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Continuing on, in uh, May and August 1996, we have two more kidnappings. Um, Sabine Darden, age 12, and Le Leticia Delhez, age... Leticia, Leticia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Leticia Delhez, age 14. <clears throat> and uh, in this case, there actually is someone who's able to witness the kidnapping and, uh, and remembered like a partial license plate, which led to the arrest of Dutroux. So in this case, when Dutroux is arrested, he actually confesses and leads the police to his dungeon. Um, I was not able to determine why he did this exactly. Yeah, I've, I've always found this particular aspect of it really interesting. Yeah. Um, so let's just uh, keep this in mind that he, you know, it's important to kind of understand like he confesses to this and that's why this breaks open. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, because of this, you know, like there's there's a lot of evidence that's uncovered in once Dutro like basically points at to things for the police. Like here's the dungeon. They're like, oh, this is a, this is a dungeon. Wow. Didn't notice that before. So that yeah. kind of starts to happen. And uh, the investigation is then placed under new leadership. So this guy, Jean-Marc Connerot, I think, Conner. Conero, maybe he's put put in charge of the investigation and uh, he is already sort of famous in Belgium for being put in charge of the the investigation into the murder of Andre Cools, who was a socialist politician that was assassinated. Uh, And he's kind of given the runaround on that case and, and pulled off of it before he's able to like, kind of like close it. Yeah. He, he had a, he had a reputation as uh you know a kind of one of the like the last honest men in belgium's sort of political yeah. um class um and the andre Kuhls thing as well is also there are suggestions that in some way it's connected to the the true case i think there was a, a motorcycle or something that was found at one of his properties that matched the description of one that was used in his assassination uh-huh. but that was ne- that never went anywhere so right. i don't know I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. So it is interesting that he is placed on the case, given that he's certainly like going to actually pursue it. You know, um, mm-hmm. there was a little bit of like inside baseball that I was able to kind of figure out that like, OK, so basically good guys are put on the case. And on the first day, literally the first day that he's put on the case, uh, he achieves a breakthrough. And um, Dutroux comes to him on that first day, basically. Uh, there's a third search uh, that takes place over the course of three hours of the home. And uh, in this case, they actually find the girls in the dungeon. Um, mm-hmm. And the girls describe what happened to them. They say that they were being used as child prostitutes and that they were used in the production of child pornography videos. More than 300 videos uh, were taken into custody by the police. Although, sorry, I should, I should, there, that was the initial report was that there was 300. It turns out that there was actually less than a hundred. It was something like 80 videos. And yeah, one time I think it got as high as 5,000. Yes. It? People um, kind of went a little crazy with it, but yeah. the, the, I think the kind of most substantiated uh, number is around 80 or we'll say less than 100 and in fact not even all of those showed they were not all like porn- pornographic uh, some mm-hmm. of them showed him just building the dungeon and, and whatnot so uh, but there there certainly was you know videos of that nature included in that um, in an interview conducted several years later one of the girls related that Dutro told her that she was being kidnapped by a gang that her parents did not want to pay, and that the gang therefore was planning to kill her. He presented himself as the good guy protecting her from the gang, and he let her write letters to her family, which he read but never posted. So I think, I don't know, there, you know, already in two of these cases, we see a kind of a, a motive about revenge against the parents kind of a thing going on. Um, mm. And so I don't know, I, I think that's important and it's not always brought up in discussions of the case but it did seem kind of significant to me sure um so because of the success that they have with this initial search of the you know the home with a dungeon in it uh, they continue searching dutroux's other properties and they uncover some dead bodies uh, they find the bodies of the June 95 victims, uh, which which was Julie Lejuen and Melissa Rousseau. They had apparently starved to death in the dungeon. So these were the girls that were heard crying and that were ignored. And um, while Dutroux was in custody during the winter of 95-96 over the arrest, dealing with the uh, the truck, the stolen truck, that's supposedly when they died. So they died of starvation because he was not there to attend to them. And uh, they also find the body at this property of Bernard Weinstein, uh, a 43-year-old associate of Dutroux. So apparently Dutroux had crushed Weinstein's testicles until he revealed a money hiding place, then drugged him and buried him alive. And uh, Dutroux told police that he had killed Weinstein because he failed to feed the girls during Dutroux's time in custody. Yeah. I have heard though as well that uh, his wife uh, Michelle 
was also expected to uh, care for the girls and she said that she didn't because she felt um, afraid of them or something. Yeah. Um, I, that could just be something in the translation that's missing there. But um, yeah. I mean, I could kind Weird. of understand feeling like you don't even want to acknowledge that that's happening or yeah. something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they reveal even more bodies at a third property. Uh, the, these are the victims of August 1995. And this is a place where Weinstein had lived for several years. So even though it was Detroit's property, this is where his associate Weinstein was living. So, you know, we're doing this series as a kind of like exploration of the program to kill theory and, and book. In Program to Kill, McGowan does cover this as his first chapter, and I think for good reason, and it's also the reason that we are sort of opening with it as well. And there's some things that McGowan mentions. I, I, I found that he, it was better to go to like the primary sources on a lot of this. There was a lot more detail, and it mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, it was more clarifying to do so. But there are some interesting little like tidbits that McGowan mentions as he's describing this case in his book. One of which is this. Uh, he says that elsewhere in Belgium, the News Telegraph reported that the corpses of two women and parts of a third body have been discovered in a freezer at a Lebanese restaurant in Brussels. He doesn't really explain if that's connected or not. I think he's just saying like crazy things are happening in Belgium. You know? hmm. So that's basically the the run of the crimes that Dutroux is committed and, and arrested for, this whole thing just causes massive public outrage at this point. The previous early release of Dutroux, uh, the failure of law enforcement to intervene in his activities you know, prior to this, the kind of apparent cover-up that was going on where they ignored reports from his neighbors and all of this, uh, it, it caused a massive outcry from the public and they demanded an inquiry into the handling of the investigation a change in laws and radical changes to the political and judicial system. Um, I should should probably we should probably point out as well that like I mean this would have caused massive outrage like no matter when it happened, but coming on the heels of the previous like fifteen years as well, um, yeah, the bloody eighties and you know the uh, the bombings, the Brabant killers, the assassination of Andrea Kuhls, the Lockheed bribery scandal. There's just like one thing after another, and I think that. That's why beyond just the public just being outraged and like organizing the white march, there was at least briefly kind of a genuine uh, possibility that they, there might actually be a revolution in Belgium over this because it, it just seemed like a kind of a perfect encapsulation of everything that they'd already been experiencing, you know, in the decades leading up mm -hmm. to it. They were primed basically for yeah to uh, to kick off massively uh, when when news of this broke. Sure. Yeah, for sure. They they wanted to reinstate the death penalty actually. Uh, so so mm. that had been discontinued several months before the discovery of uh, Dutroux's first victims, but they wanted to reinstate it basically just for this one guy. Um, mm. The public further demanded a tightening of the parole criteria for those convicted of child sex offenses. And this actually was finally implemented in 1998. So there were some actual reforms that came about because of this. Hmm. The Dutroux case became the main subject of an international conference in Stockholm organized by the UN's uh, Children's Fund. Uh, this was in August 28, 1996. The foreign minister emotionally called on all nations to combat the exploitation of children by enhancing mutual law enforcement and judicial cooperation. Uh, it was stressed that it was necessary for all agencies to work together. So the outrage caused by this case was not simply the severity of the crimes that Dutroux was apparently just allowed to get away with and the, the kind of like the cover up or the incompetence demonstrated by the law enforcement it was also the other people implicated in the case and uh mm -hmm. you know we we mentioned uh, uh, some of those names before relating to asco it's, it's essentially that crew of people so so uh one of detroit's assistants michelle le lievre who we, i mentioned a few times before um he was being paid in drugs if you recall he's being paid in ecstasy pills uh these pills were being supplied to him by a very well-known uh, businessman and kind of a socialite, uh, Jean-Michel Niel, uh, again, mm -hmm. also associated with the ASCO company. Um, apparently, he had supplied um, 
Le Livre, uh, with over 1,000 ecstasy pills as payment for the August 96 kidnapping. Um, so I have some quotes here. It's kind of a, a longish bit, so just bear with me. But this first one is from Michelle Martin, his wife, uh, Dutro's wife. I've heard Mark personally telling Le Livre that he should bring a girl for Michelle Neal. If I haven't mentioned that before, that is because I'm afraid of that gang. I mean, Neil, Mark Dutroux, and others in Brussels. I mean, well-placed individuals who Neil knew. The connections of Neil made me fear for my children and myself. I was afraid because Jean-Michel Neil, Mark Dutroux, and Michel Le Livre were part of a gang that was involved in all kinds of business, like drugs, pills, girls, and forged papers. Um, I have to say, oh, by the way, Neil was also later in c convicted of all these things. So th this is later substantiated quite well. Uh, I have to say that at the time of the kidnapping of Sabine and Laetitia, Michel Neil, as I already stated, often called to SARS for, to my home. He was looking for Mark Dutroux. He didn't call for me. When Neil tried to reach Mark, he always remained vague. I never knew why he so often called to Mark. Over time, I became more and more convinced that Mark and Jean-Michel did things that couldn't stand the light of day and which I was not supposed to know about. By the way, Mark told me that he went more and more to Brussels and met an increasing number of people in light of his activities with Michel Neol. Neol always gave me the impression that he had many connections that he could count on. Mark told me that Neol had taken care of many of Le Livre's problems. He had prevented that he was arrested, he had worked out his fines and solved his money problems. Mark had accurately sensed that he would benefit from continuing to see Neol because of his connections and those of his wife, the lawyer. The more they saw each other, the more they opened up, of course. I think that at a certain moment, a mutual trust was built. I see evidence of that in a conversation between Le Livre and Mark that I coincidentally heard, and in which I heard that Mark said that they had to bring back a girl for Neil. I think that Jean-Michel had influence on Mark Dutroux. Mark often told me that he was impressed by the connections Neil had. There's um, a lot of speculation over when they would have actually run across each other, uh, Neil and Dutroux. Right. And there are, as far as I know, there are two accounts of it. So the first uh, is that when Dutroux was in prison the first time in the 80s, uh, that's when he met Neil. Uh, Le Livre, I think, told police that um, Dutroux and Neil would meet in the exercise yard and they were always making plans for like capers and schemes that they get up to once they got released. Uh, and already at that point, Neil was a really well-known uh, Brussels businessman. He had, um, I think he owned a, a number of pubs and clubs. Witnesses said that they actually saw some of the girls who Dutroux had kidnapped. They saw them at his clubs while Dutroux was in prison uh, in uh, the 90s, uh, you know, before he got released again. Um so there's that version of things. And then there's, I guess we'll be talking about her in a bit, but Regina uh, Luth yeah, says we'll that, that she had, yeah, she'd seen the true and Yule together much earlier than um, the late 80s. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll come around to that, I guess. Right, sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, I also have some uh, testimony from Le Livre himself. Uh, he said that Mark always told me that he kidnapped girls for people who had placed an order with him. When he came out of prison in March 1996, I asked him who did the orders when he was in jail. He answered me that somebody else did that and that he certainly wasn't the only one. When we went to pick up a girl, Mark wanted, wanted that she corresponded with the order, small hips. He gave me a description of the girl that we were looking for. One day, I asked him why they and, and FJ, I think two girls, were still with him even though he, he claimed he had an order. He told me that the people who had placed the order had come, but that they weren't interested in them. Dutroux explained to me that he had conditioned the girls to be obedient and submissive when they arrived at customers. I would like to reveal mm -hmm. other things about Jean-Michel Nio, but I don't want these testimonies are taken up in the dossier. I said, I fear for my life and those around me. I remind you that Nio told me the following, if you cross me, I will destroy you. With those words, he made it known to me that he would kill me or have me killed. He does seem uh, quite happy to be known um, as a serious guy as well as uh, Neil. There's um, an investigative journalist called uh, Alenka Frankel, I think she's called. 
She did a lot of good uh, work around this in the 90s. She actually met him to interview him for The Guardian when all this was breaking. And uh, so uh, this is just a a brief quote from the article. Um, I met Newell in a restaurant in Brussels. I am the monster of Belgium. He roared at me by way of greeting. He is confident he will never come to trial and that the evidence against him will never be heard by any jury. During the course of our meal, um, blah, blah, blah. uh, He will never come to court, he said, because the information he has about important people in Belgium would bring the government down. The monster of Belgium denies he's a paedophile, but seems to enjoy his notoriety, and he demanded a thousand pound for his story. So, I don't... I don't really know what to make of that, but obviously he's happy to be known um, as a, a big player. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of strikes me as like a mafia kind of a guy almost. Mm, um, yeah. So, Neil, I mean, we, we should really like, uh, here, I'll, I'll kind of provide this to kind of characterize him further. So he actually confesses to organizing an orgy at a Belgian chateau that had been attended by government officials, a former European commissioner, and a number of law enforcement uh, officers. A Belgian senator would mm-hmm. note quite accurately that such parties were part of a system which operate to this day and is used to blackmail the highly placed people who take part. Um, although convicted for financial fraud, drug, and human trafficking due to the overwhelming amount of evidence, Neil was ultimately acquitted from charges that he was involved in the kidnapping and murder of any of Dutroux's girls. And as we mentioned before, he's also a player in the ASCO company. Whatever was going on there, that was never fully investigated. But, you know, there was obviously something happening there. I have always found it um, interesting that the the kind of conspiracy people never ran wild with it, that uh, he died in October of 2019, you know, only a few months after like Epstein. Mm. I thought it was. I've always thought it's quite interesting that nobody seemed to. Uh, I I never you know, uh, connected those dots. With that. That's interesting. I, I mean, I honestly, I don't think there's anything in it at all. Right. But Twitter being Twitter, I would have expected somebody to do <laughs> sure, you sure. Know, a fifty post thread at this point or something. Yeah. What do you make of it, Don? Just like out of interest so far. Um. I guess. Uh, well, the first thought that I had, kind of about everything, was just that, like. You know, the cover-ups and stuff like that, it, you kind of wonder, like, uh, it, it seems to sort of exist in this gray area where you're like, okay, mm-hmm. well, if there's a cover-up, why isn't there a complete cover-up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like, why is it, yeah. why why do things get out? Why mm-hmm. do things kind of fail to keep the seal, basically, you know? So, like, I guess that's the thing. So, you kind of have to think, like, okay, it's like, it's sort of in a gray area where there might be just so much abuse happening that like this is more the kind of like mid level or like just you know what I mean? Like it's just it's just certain things aren't contained because they're just being half assed kind of thing or something. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. Cause cause I, yeah. Th- I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean like I this is the thing I find so confusing about this this Neil guy. I've always found this confusing how he's giving interviews to journalists where he's he's bragging about his involvement in something and it alludes to something to do with like sex and orgies but then when he's when he's in at trial he's denying everything and i i don't understand how i don't understand how his media appearances weren't used against him or you know i i don't know yeah i I get what you mean Um, yeah yeah um yeah the other thing though is like it's the belgian system we're not as familiar with it as we would be like with our Mm -hmm. home countries so there's a little bit of like we can't assume that it was, should go a certain way necessarily, you know, it, as far as the details yeah, of it go yeah. and all that. So there's a little mm-hmm. bit of uh, a culture barrier there too. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. So at this point, the story becomes a little bit like there's there's kind of three major things that I want to hit on here. And I, I want to do it a little bit quickly. We've kind of bombarded you guys with the details already. Uh, but at this point, there's something that happens, which is quite important. But... Interestingly, I often find that it's not even mentioned in uh, English language reporting of the case. It, sometimes it is, like even it's even mentioned on Wikipedia, and in fact, the Wikipedia for this case is pretty good, um, which is a little surprising. But what happens uh, with the publicity that this case attracts is that a number of other witnesses start to come forward, testifying as victims of Dutroux, and they often uh, corroborate each other. They things line up. 
or they're substantiated by evidence. Their descriptions of locations that they're talking about are like perfect descriptions. For example, they talk about different clubs. Uh, so most of these witnesses are uh, women who are describing their experiences in childhood of being taken to clubs for abuse and torture and uh, and videotaping, you know, of these acts. Uh, and, and they're called the X-Files or the X-Dossiers or the X-Witnesses uh, because each witness is given X and a number. So like witness X1, witness X2. Uh, some of these people have been doxxed or just publicly kind of come out with their name and identity. So one of the most important witnesses in the case is X1, uh, Regina Loof. And uh, her... Like her, her testimony seems to be the most substantial and uh, longest one. Uh, there's a lot of absolutely horrific detail in this stuff, and I'm not going to get into that at all. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even recommend your listeners bother reading it themselves, to be honest. Yeah, um, so, and some of the sources that uh, we we looked at, as Matt and I talked about earlier, include pictures that are not exactly technically pornographic, but they are scarring images and Mm. there's really no need for anyone to see them um Mm -hmm. but basically there's a pattern that emerges with all these various witnesses of the families are the the ones who often take these children to to this like ring um it's it's not Mm. really kidnapping as such with with all these witnesses it's often the families that take them to the clubs um the witnesses knew each other from the clubs so it's essentially the way it seemed to work was like these different nightclubs and hotels and things like that would have private sections where this stuff would occur. And it goes beyond imagination, some of the stuff that was happening. Uh, the most wildest testimonies come from a certain witness who describes a satanic cult called Abraxas that had very important like higher up type people there. I'm going to avoid naming names because of uh, libel laws in in the UK and stuff. Matt has kind of told me they're mm-hmm. pretty crazy, so we're going to avoid specifics. <laughs> but you. the the most like shocking thing about this is that they have like hunting parties where they would hunt children on castle estates. Some of the locations that were named, I looked them up on Google Maps and such, and kind of looked around, and they just it's just like a castle with a, a large campus, you know, and it's all behind like a gated thing so there's kind of like a wooded area or whatever you know so very like classic aristocratic manner type of a thing uh but they have these uh child hunting parties there i won't like dwell on this bit too much but this uh in the x dossiers the descriptions of the the woodland trails that they were told to run down uh they match up perfectly with what's actually there yeah, yeah. So their descriptions of locations are match. Um, they they identify one another as being in these locations at certain times. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. it, it all kind of lines up. They describe like bizarre kind of like satanic rituals uh, at some of these things involving uh, abuse that involved like animals and, and whatnot in, in really horrific ways. And uh, essentially, I'll leave it at that. I'll, uh, my point here being that these these children are used in this way. They are almost all of them have some form of a DID, so like dissociative identity disorder, or what was known as multiple personality disorder, uh, which is almost always the result of trauma that's inflicted on, like a, an extreme trauma that someone experiences in childhood. Uh, it seems like that may be incidental or purposeful, uh, you know, purposefully inflicted on these people so that they're you know they're not able to really uh you know just to mess them up enough right so that they're sure. they're in, I, unreliable witnesses and, and whatnot there there was a, a group of court appointed psychiatrists who checked out regina loof and they said that she does suffer from ptsd and uh did yeah. as well but that doesn't impact the testimony that she's given they've got no reason to believe that she was lying or making any of it up But honestly, I I think the reason they do this kind of stuff, like the satanic rituals and everything, I know people, they kind of, they like to get, um, 
they like to kind of really revel in it and sort of obsess over it. But I honestly think that a big part of the reason they do it is just because they know that nobody's going to believe the kids. Um, yeah, it, it helps discredit the kids. The, the weirder and more surreal you can make um, the experience. You know? Sure. Uh, yeah. It's, it's quite banal, but I think that is honestly the main reason they do it. Um to discredit them. Basically. Yeah, I, I in some of the other cases that we'll discuss in the future, there are things that seem very pointedly to be that, like that serving that kind of practical purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's also a little bit of like, if you think about how these are old aristocratic families that have this kind of like, the, they want to have these old traditions and stuff. I think there's an element to, the, to that, that some of these are kind of, there it's almost like a like an old folk tradition or something you know that they have like yeah. they're like the keeping up with the old ways or something i th- i think there's something like that going on here but again we're we're running into speculation here so we'll we'll pull back a little bit the the main takeaway from yeah. from these uh testimonies of the ex witnesses is very well substantiated corroborated testimonies to completely like absurd levels of abuse uh you know hunting parties and Mm. uh satanic rituals are the main thing there um there was a raid on the uh, location where the supposed like satanic ritual was occurring and it was broadcast on national television in belgium they they showed Mm. there was it was a massive raid of like hundreds of police officers and they were pulling out bones and masks and just all kinds of bizarre stuff uh, that indicated mm. that, yeah, they were up to something there, you know? Mm. Um, so we'll, we'll move on from there. The next kind of major point that I want to get to is the spaghetti affair with uh, Jean-Marc Connerut, who was the, the lead investigator who actually cracked the case open and everything. He mm-hmm. eventually was dismissed from the case by the Supreme Court. They removed him because he attended a fundraising dinner that was organized to help in search of missing children. Not for the Dutro-related missing children, but more of like a general kind of fundraising thing. Um, however, at that fundraising dinner, two of Dutro's victims were there, and that was sort of the determining factor that had him pulled. They they believed that that caused him to lose his objectivity in his investigations and so that he had to be removed. Uh, it's called the spaghetti affair because there were, you essentially like were donating some amount of money and you were given a plate of spaghetti in return. So he actually paid for his plate of spaghetti. He was given a pen as a gift. Uh, he paid for that as well. Uh, he tried to stay away from the two girls that were related to the case. Like they were on the other side of the room. He didn't approach them or talk to them or anything and he only stayed for an hour he just kind of wanted to make an appearance and uh and all that but that was enough to kind of get him pulled from the case that obviously caused a further outrage you know people were kind of identifying this as like you know what does this have to do with anything you know sure um so soon thereafter uh we have what's called the white march in fact it was it was less than a week after this the white march occurs and this is the big general strike so october 20 1996 more than 300,000 people uh, take to the streets dressed in white as a symbol of innocence and they march through the city of brussels demanding serious reforms within the political and judicial system yeah it, it's interesting because it is like a genuine strike it's not like a, just a protest march there were car assembly plants were left vacant with workers walking away in anger uh train operators mm-hmm. refused to work there was actually uh in some places where the public transportation was still operating there were people who would throw stones at the trams and the trains and stuff uh on people who were were trying to use the transportation system so it really became like a like a labor action, you know, it it wasn't Mm -hmm. simply a protest, which I kind of find interesting that it took that shape. Oh, and another thing is that in Liege, firemen turned their hoses on the city's court building to symbolize the massive cleanup that was in order. So Mm. I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So the prime minister said, this is a strong signal, which we cannot ignore. Uh, He further stated that the movement was good because it would speed up reforms. He promised not only that he would see to it that there would be reforms in the justice system, but also see the Dutroux investigation pursued to the end. And even the King Albert spoke up about the case and called for reform. So everyone kind of like 
turned around and said, yeah, this is bad. We need to do something about this. So kind of like they had to address it. They couldn't just continue to, to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Um, however, what's happened is Conrad is pulled off the case, right? So he's replaced with uh, Jacques Langlois, who had previously been uh, appointed to the case, but went on vacation the same day. <laughs> These people keep taking vacations when they're appointed to the case. So he had left the first day, and that had allowed room for Conrad to be put in charge instead, which is interesting we could kind of ask like was it supposed to be that way or was this the mistake they made that blew the case open where they had this gap for it it's kind of unclear to me i know matt you sort of tend to think that for some reason that this was supposed to happen right i mean i yeah i'm trying to stay away from like speculating too much but part of me wonders if it finally got blown as part of some kind of similar to epstein like some sort of intra elite warfare that was going on um i mean i don't know what shape that would have taken or anything but yeah it it's it definitely feels like the police uh weren't didn't didn't so much uncover this case as they knew about it and they just chose to act on it at a time of their convenience sure um yeah so but i don't i I can't really go beyond that because like you say i mean you just get into realms of like endless speculation <laughs> after a certain yeah exactly point. yeah I, I mean to me it does seem that this was sort of like a like a pressure vent kind of a thing like they needed to vent out some mm. of the stuff and they were able to just give up this low life scumbag true who they didn't really care about you know he wasn't part of high society yeah. he was just some guy they employed so make him the the big bad guy here make sure he's taken care of and then we can kind of wrap it up and move on you know mm. i mean i think that the reason they'd put someone like uh Conor in charge is because that does give it the appearance of being a, like a legitimate investigation sure um and then the fact that they took him off the investigation would sort of tend to indicate that maybe he was stepping outside the bounds of what they'd prescribed as being acceptable um for for him to explore Mm -hmm. um and yeah and then i guess like 25 30 murdered witnesses later um then it was kind of okay there's no chance that this will go any further they've got the white march out of their systems um we can start doing some sort of you know uh symbolic resignations shift some personnel around it seems that like things are calming down a little bit yeah yeah so the country's state police chief uh the interior minister and the justice minister all resigned as a result of the white march in the in the kind of aftermath of this and in the like 97 98 period of time uh there was kind of a number of things that popped up around the case with like police officers being implicated uh, there were essentially there was like little uh, loose ends that kept appearing. I think we'll leave it at that. I don't want to like bog this episode down too much with all the details of that, and they're not nothing really ground shaking there. There is an interesting thing that I found, which is Conrad's letter to King Albert in 1996. So essentially, as soon as he's put on the case, right, he he writes this letter to the king uh, because he believes he's uncovered something really substantial. So. What he says is that that his his role had become untenable and no progress could be reasonably made due to a judiciary dysfunction which turned into a veritable institution whose smooth running assures the legitimacy of certain criminal activities and the impunity of those responsible. So essentially he's saying he's kind of uncovered some sort of network of people that are able to provide cover for this kind of activity. Uh, This institution seems to acquire its authority and supremacy over sectors of the justice system by relying on a complex and secret modus operandi, that of the appropriation of certain key circuits of our institutions created and regulated by the law. It is a matter essentially of political, financial, police, and media circuits. This mafia-style criminal phenomenon is is evidently not peculiar to Belgium, but involves uh, particular manifestations that are well-suited to this small country, which is essentially what we were trying to get at in our previous session, you know, Mm. to set up uh, this episode. 
Uh, we can imagine the obstacles that a judiciary inquiry will meet when investigating such facts. Numerous taboos, problems of mentality, and a lack of cultural reference on the issue in order to be able to become aware of or deal with such criminal phenomena, taking advantage in Belgium of official reticence in terms of their acknowledgement, which favors or supports their occultation. Uh, the function of a criminal system of this sort is obviously to serve its fundamental purpose, the pursuance of particularly profitable illicit activities, such as money laundering, and to protect the legitimacy of its activities and the impunity of its agents. This indispensable function corresponds to the motive of criminal protection that assures the permanency of the incriminated system by means of the infiltration of certain circuits of our institutions, especially the police force, a veritable knot which my whole investigation has come up against. Mm. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, and that's the lead investigator, right? I, I felt like that kind of sums it up, and I, th I feel like he's a fairly uh, reputable source to be talking about this kind of thing. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I trust him. I mean, he, he is effectively, I think we touched on this last time, he is effectively describing what we did, which is if if this was happening in some other context, you know, we would just call it organized crime. But the fact that it's happening right at the heart of the state kind of makes it a taboo subject, you know, to investigate or to talk about or to cover. Right. And news. also, you know, I think that part of the whole, like the, the way Pizzagate got spun and QAnon and all this sort of stuff, mm -hmm. I think that that sort of plays into that strategy of making uh, this stuff seem like culturally like a, a no-go. You know, it just becomes like a ridiculous yeah. thing or it's politicized in, a, in an absurd way that sort of whether you believe the the QAnon style theories or or not, by discussing that, by playing in that field, you're not really actually addressing the real the, the reality. You know, you're, you're kind of in a fantasy sure, yeah. land, whether you're pro or con. Uh, that, that seems like a fairly effective sort of thing. Same thing with Epstein, right? Like, like it became like this meme thing, you know? Well, it's interesting because that actually happens in this as well with uh, Regina Louf, mm -hmm. um, the the Belgium State TV, um, RTBF, I think it is. They basically began this kind of sustained campaign of um, character assassination against her. Right. And finally, she ended up actually being removed uh, as a, a witness because in the court's estimation, the, the coverage had discredited her. Um, so that's and that also sort of you can see that on a broader scale if you look at like the guardian bbc western news coverage of the de true story in the 90s and even the early 2000s it was quite open-minded about the possibility that there was some sort of wider deeper network of corruption going on when they cover it now it's just like he was just an isolated serial killer sure um and at most the police are guilty of incompetence mm -hmm. um right which I suspect has already sort of started happening with something like, you know, Epstein. Uh, and, you know, it, that I think that ball will keep rolling. Now. Mm -hmm. So w one final thing I wanted to point out here before we kind of end this episode is the uh, legal defense that Dutroux employed. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting the, the route they took. So they claim that he's guilty for uh, kidnapping and trafficking. They plead guilty on that, but they plead not guilty to murder. And uh, their big thing is claiming that he's a small fish. Uh, so they say that he was not the only devil. Uh, that's something that his lawyer said. And they point to the fact that the police failed to process uh, forensic evidence. Um, notably, 6,000 hair samples found in the basement cellar, you know, in the dungeon. And uh, that had led to the discovery of 25 unknown DNA profiles. So there was apparently, like, people you know visiting that dungeon um the prosecutor uh agreed that it was likely Dutroux was not an isolated predator and that both he Neo Le, Le Levre, and michelle martin were part of a network of some kind in mcgowan's book after he kind of closes his discussion of Dutroux, he goes on to talk about a number of similar like child pornography rings in other countries he talks about um, a ring in Latvia in 1999 where 2,000, more than 2,000 children are discovered. Uh, and it's a case that is, ends up being linked to the prime minister, justice minister, 
director of state revenue service and a number of army and law enforcement officers. Uh, and they attempt to discredit the investigatory commission chairman with allegations of ties to the KGB. Um, in the same year, there's uh, 13 men who are implicated in a child pornography ring operating in Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic, uh, which possibly has connections given that Dutru uh, was known to often visit a certain town in Slovakia where children were taken to for this particular ring. In uh, Mexico in 1996, a, uh, a ring with 4,000 plus clients is found uh, operating out of a resort in Acapulco, uh, sometimes involving babies less than one month old. In September 2000, there's a ring operating in uh, Italy and Russia called Necros Pedo that involved 1,700 people. Yeah, so it goes on like this, and uh, I don't know. We'll, I think we'll end it there uh, for now. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you guys some clarity on this issue. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. What, what do you? Uh, what are you guys' thoughts at this point? Yeah, I know it's pretty grim stuff, uh, pretty uh, disturbing, but like uh, it does, you do see like uh, the overlapping institutional sort of things where you're like, well, if this person knew, then this person had to have known or whatever. And then all the different mm -hmm. like criminal interactions with the police and stuff where, uh, you know, I always think like when you're talking about some sort of conspiracy kind of stuff, it's like, okay, well if it was a conspiracy, why wouldn't it be like sealed tight? Like why, mm -hmm. why are there all these leaks? Why are there all these uh, mistakes basically? Right. Like why, why are all of these people being like, if you're letting people just sort of bring their kid to get abused kind of thing or something like that, that's not like that. That's not closed loop kind of thing. Right. Like that's a pretty, that that is kind of like brazen at some level, kind of thing, right? Like for a lot sure, of these, uh, yeah. And uh, there's actually let me and, let me just yeah. bring up something that we didn't mention earlier, but I think you might find it interesting, just kind of in light of this point. Regina Loof, the X one witness, she was actually able to leave the ring and leave the kind of uh, the network of you know where the stuff was happening by moving in with a boyfriend. She she fell in love with somebody mm -hmm. and uh, moved in with him, and they kind of let her do it. Yeah. But later, she was eventually like pulled back into it. So there's sort of something interesting where I think they find it easier to deal with people when they don't have to kind of have them dealt with in like this, like the way Dutroux did with like building a literal dungeon. Like I think sure. generally it's easier for them to kind of allow these people to live somewhat normal lives and just to have this like dark hidden part of their life that pops up every now and then uh, she would describe yeah. the way her pimp would basically just show up and take her on certain nights you know and then bring her back yeah yeah because if you think of like if it's if it involves very powerful people or something like that you would think that they would have to create like like almost like black site situations where there's no there's no leaks there's no there's no problem of getting caught basically other than just random people stumbling on some remote location or something like that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, it, it, yeah. it seems like that. And not only that, but I mean, I guess, you know, we're talking about 30 years ago or more, but like, you said something like they, they, they would resell the girls for like 7,000 euro or something like that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Right. Like that seems like a small amount of money to me. I don't know. Like for, for a, a human life kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. It seems like. Yeah. You're, that, so that's true. It kind of surprised me too, to find the, the, the amounts, you know? So I feel like that, that again, it gets this kind of idea that like, I, I guess there's two ways to look at it. Like you, you could either say that it reinforces the idea that this is kind of like a weird operation that would have been caught quickly and just there's like incompetence or something like that, like sort of like the official kind of maybe narrative right now or something. But like, uh, but like it also sort of makes you think like, if you kind of imply that the existence of this implies the, the existence of like the more black sites, closed loop, high level professional kind of version of it, right? Like that makes it seem like there's a lot more terrible things going on than, you know what I mean? Like it just, it just seems sort, sort mm -hmm. of implies that like, if this is happening in a certain gray zone area, then it's like, and it's, it's it seems sort of half-assed to some extent and involves like, more straightforward sort of like you know like we're talking about people like uh 
police and being able to remove judges and all this stuff. Like there's high level power involved in that kind of thing, but like it's still sort of uneven. Like you can see like there's there are prosecutors that were taking it seriously and somewhat and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it, it seems mm-hmm. sort of like a, it seems confused kind of thing for for something that would be like a total conspiracy or something like that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah, I I agree. It's not super clear, you know. Like I I think that we're not really going to be able to pin down exactly to what extent, like how far does this go, and sure. why do we mm-hmm. know what we know about it, and all that sort of a thing. But my impression is that this would, if you think about like some of the stuff that the ex witnesses were describing, the stuff that Dutroux was doing probably like is lower on their list of concern about like, Oh, well, if people find out about that, we'll just deal with that, you know, as just this lone wolf crime thing. But if they find out that, you know, nobility in the country are organizing hunting parties for humans, human children, you know, and, and doing that kind of stuff, that's probably like a bigger, like, okay, we really have to make sure no one finds out about that. Or, uh, you know, production of, like, child pornography and snuff films on some kind of, like, industrial scale. That that seems pretty major. But, like, these one-off kidnappings and stuff where it's, you know, something that was, like, for this one guy for his, like, parties and stuff. I feel like that seems like something they can deal with. You know, it's kind of like when you're sure. a something like Pablo Escobar or whatever, if one of your trucks gets stopped at the border, you don't really care about it. But if if you're the guy who's in charge of that one truck, like that's your whole thing, you know, and that becomes like a bigger yeah. deal. So yeah, I think, well, I think you're right that there is like an implied extension of this. Well, I mean, and we're going to get more into the PTK stuff later on, but like, I mean, there is a certain element here where you're also like, it might be okay for some people to find out some of the more horrifying stuff that's more low level that doesn't include a lot of the connections because uh, that might play some sort of terror role in the public and stuff like that kind of thing. So, you know, like it's not, it's not necessarily bad if uh, horrifying things leak out ever so often if uh, they demoralize people. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, hopefully we haven't scarred you too much, uh, dear listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, like I said earlier, I really tried to keep this kind of fairly uh, distant from the, the real gruesome details. I think I did a decent job, hopefully. Yeah, I, I mean, the main point here was just to kind of establish that this is like a real thing that we know about happening. And they're, they're, uh, it, it's it's got some pretty like, I, I don't know, it, it, it seems to be significant you know, like the, the implications of it. Uh, what, sure. what, even if it is just like a one-off thing and there's just, it, it's just something that's particular to Belgium. I don't think that's true at all. I think we can kind of, uh, see that this happens all over the place, but even if it was just happening in Belgium, it's pretty wild. Uh, the, the people it's connected to and, and all that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this will kind of be, the uh the kickoff point for like the the reason we chose to start with Dutro and the, I think the same reason that McGowan chooses to start with it is because it's it's the most easily substantiated story about this happening and then when you start to look at other cases and you see the similarities and even possible direct connections at times uh it starts to paint a picture that s- something is is like up there's something going on in the way that like why does this exist on the scale that it does and why is it covered up all over the place the way it is you know it starts to paint a picture when we start to look at these other cases and things like that so the next episode we're going to be covering mcmartin and franklin in a a more of a critical kind of a view there's actually that's one case where i think that it's interesting because of the way that there's a lot of misinformation i think and a lot of um hysteria around it that you know people kind of talk about the satanic panic and all that and uh well anyway we'll 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 get to that when we get to it um sure yeah let's, we'll just leave it off here matt is there anything you wanted to uh end with any final thoughts here um i guess um as far as this goes the the true thing like for a long time i always went back and forth on um what was really going on and i can kind of i am sympathetic to a lot of like the debunker arguments about it but i i can never get past regina loof's testimony 
uh, being substantiated. You know, the descriptions of different places and helping to actually close off a a cold case homicide from like 10 mm-hmm. years before. Yeah, um, I didn't mention that, but yeah, that's true. And yeah, and the the 25 witnesses that and investigators that died during the investigation itself. Um, I've seen people say that, well, that, you know, on a long enough timeline, I bet you could do that with lots of other cases as well. But it's like, dude, people were being like fucking burned alive in their bed and shot in the head, you know, on the street. I hate when night. that happens. Like these were know? not like, yeah, yeah. like... These were not people who were dying of natural causes. Like it was quite the opposite. Um, so just for that reason, that's I can never get beyond that. So I that leads me to suspect that, yeah, something else was going on. Quite you know, quite a lot of corruption. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm always left with with the true. But I think also there might I think I mentioned this last week. There might be like a a cultural thing too because if you grow up in Britain. You grow up kind of expecting the worst in in terms of this kind of level of um, depravity from the people who run your uh, country. So when you hear about it happening in somewhere else, you kind of like, eh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, sadly, you know. Sure. Yeah, I, I imagine um, you know Americans are probably feeling that way with uh, Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell and all that. Like, they're you know maybe this is sort of a. I don't know, kind of we can see it in a new light now that we just kind of know what this would might look like in our own country on, you know. I think it's quite funny as well mm-hmm. that like, as in Belgium, like so in America, so like Ghislaine Maxwell was British. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> this whole That's weird true, political yeah. system was sort of imposed on Belgium by the British. The fucking British just spreading their pedophilia all over the globe. <laughs> yeah yeah sure uh there's something that i uh encountered while reading about this case that i thought was kind of funny and pretty dark and maybe it's like a good place to, to end the episode on but i guess there's a saying in belgium that belgium is known for two things chocolate and pedophilia and that in the the former is mainly in service of the latter <laughs> oh god oh uh, yeah okay fair enough <laughs> yeah well thanks for joining us yeah Matt, thanks for, for having uh, me guys <laughs> he's <laughs> yeah. yeah uh yeah thanks for coming matt you, no, were, you were really great and like uh yeah uh thanks for your help on this no problem man. anytime all right guys well uh yeah that'll wrap it up for this one and uh we'll catch you next time bye bye thanks guys cheers bye